and welcome to this week's session of Masterclass in Spine. We're going to cover two topics this week. One is spinal tumors and the second one is spinal infections with a special focus on tuberculosis of the spine. Am I audible to everybody? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank, yes, you. Sir. thank you. Thank you. So, spinal tumors could be divided into different groups. Number one is intradural, which is within the dural sheath, and extradural. Intradural tumors could be inside the spinal cord, it's called intramedullary, which could be ependymomas, astrocytomas, and hemangioblastomas. They could be outside the spinal cord, but inside the dura like meningiomas, neurofibromas, and schwannomas. Or they could be outside the dura. So predominantly from the vertebral, uh, from the vertebrae. And the most common one in that category is metastasis. And the second one is primary tumors in the spine. So this is what is an intramedullary tumor, which is inside the spinal cord. This is an extramedullary tumor which is outside the spinal cord, but intradural. And this is an extradural tumor, which is outside the dura. Okay, so these are the different histopathological diagnoses. Uh, metastasis being the most common and schwannomas and meningiomas being the next most common. Spinal tumors, especially the extradural tumors, uh, most commonly occur in the thoracic spine. The next is the cervical spine and least common is in the lumbar spine. So the important thing is to recognize these symptoms and patients typically present with back pain may or may not be radiating, difficulty in walking, but the pain in spinal tumors is quite different from pain due to other conditions. So I don't remember, uh, for those of you who attended the first session on back pain, I told you that back pains can be divided into three broad categories. So that is back pain that occurs at night, more at night, back pain that is felt more in the morning. And the third one is back pain that occurs during the day with activity. Now back pain that occurs during the day with activity is typically degenerative back pain. So it could be facet arthritis, disc degeneration, neural compression, all of them can cause activity related pain. Pain that is felt more in the morning after rest is typically inflammatory back pain like seronegative spondyloarthropathies like ankylosing spondylitis. But pain that occurs predominantly at night that disturbs sleep could be either due to tumors or could be due to infection. So these are these not, not hard and fast rules, but it's a good guide when you're taking your history. And you need to ask the patient, when do you feel more pain and does the pain disturb your sleep? So that is about the pain. If there is any neural compression, they may have difficulty in walking. They may have loss of blood, uh, loss of sensations and muscle weakness in the legs. There may be loss of bladder and bowel function. Uh, there may be a spinal deformity because of any, either because of collapse of the vertebrae or due to the pain itself causing a scoliosis. Um, there may be destruction of the vertebral body because of the tumors. But the most important thing, because once the patient has de developed a neurological deficit, then, you know, you quite... Uh, late in the pro, uh, in the um, progress of the disease. So it's important if you can pick them up earlier before they develop any neurological deficits. And that is predominantly by taking a history of pain. So we'll discuss three cases today. And uh, I've made it a case study format just to make it a little, little more different, a little different from the previous lectures. So we, the first one is a 27 year old male who came with neck pain of four months duration. The pain was severe, but the pain was more at night and disturbing his sleep. It was non-radiating, not going down the arms. There was no fever or constitutional symptoms and the neurological examination was normal. So we got x-rays done, which did not show anything. 
The CT scan showed a small lesion here. You can see this here, which I marked with a black arrow. There's a small lesion. So there's a lytic region there with the nidus in the center. So something like this in a 27 year old uh, should point towards a benign osteo, osteoid osteoma. And that shows up like a high uptake area on a bone scan. So, so based on the bone scan and the CT scan, we made a diagnosis of osteoid osteoma. So the options are either, uh, is to remove the osteoid osteoma like this. It could be done open. It could be done percutaneously. There is a good option of doing it with radiofrequency frequency ablation, especially in the non-spine osteoid osteomas. But in the spine, it's a little more tricky because you're very close to the nerve and you're probably better off doing it either open or, or um, you know, image-guided percutaneously, uh, navigation-guided percutaneously. Laser ablation is another option, but in non-spine osteodosteomas. So this is what the specimen looked like after excision. So that's what the specimen looked like. You can see the osteodosteoma there. And that's the C, we got a CT scan of the specimen just to make sure you can see this nidus here, which is bright here. And uh, got a CT scan just to make sure that we've removed the entire nidus uh, during surgery uh, before the patient was extubated. So that is about osteodosteoma. So osteodosteomas are benign tumors of the spine. They cause a lot of pain, and the treatment is predominantly is surgical or some sort of intervention could be surgical or radiofrequency ablation, but in the spine predominantly surgical. Now we're talking about primary malignant tumors in the spine. So they're very less common. Less than 5% of primary bone tumors occur in the spine. So, you know, the osteodosteoma, the osteosarcomas, the chondrosarcomas, the Ewing sarcomas, chordomas, and malignant fibrous histiocytoma, malignant fibrous histiocytoma and fibrosarcomas are the more common primary malignant tumors, uh, but they're less common in the spine. So I'll give you a, another case. Um, discussion. There's a 54 year old lady who presented to us with an unsteady gait of two months and she had numbness and clumsiness in both hands. On examination, definitely she uh, she wasn't able to walk in a straight line, so the tandem walk was affected. Her hand function was not normal. She was not able to grasp uh, with full strength. There was upper motor neuron signs in all four limbs, indicating a very proximal uh, lesion but there was no muscle weakness as such. So that's what the uh, X-ray looked like. And if you look very closely at the X-ray, that's C1 there, that's C C2, but you can see the C th uh, C3 is completely collapsed there. So that led us to get a MRI done. And you can see that the C3 vertebra is completely collapsed. Part of it, there's part of it going anteriorly and there's a significant part going posteriorly compressing. You can see it more clearer in the contrast scans, uh, compressing on the spinal cord quite significantly. Although the spinal cord did not show any edema, there is a little bit of edema here, uh, but the patient had upper motor neuron signs in the lower limb. So indicating cord compression uh, more proximally. And uh, if you're suspecting a tumor, it's important that you get an MRI scan done with contrast. So that will help the radiologist um, figure out a diagnosis, at least an imaging-based diagnosis much more easily. We got a CT scan also done just to see what has happened to the bone. And you can see that the significant ballooning of that vertebra, so significantly inside the canal, outside the canal, so this is what we did for the patient. We did a front and back surgery, removed the whole vertebra, removed the spinous process and everything from both sides because this was the only lesion and uh, biopsy showed that it was a chondrosarcoma. So chondrosarcomas do not respond to chemotherapy and radiation. So the only treatment for chondrosar chondrosarcomas is surgical wide excision if you were looking for a cure. So since this patient had only one lesion without any lung meds, we thought we'd go in and offer her a cure. But uh, in the cervical spine, because of the presence of the spinal cord and the presence of the vertebral arteries, which are tracking uh, 
through the foramina in the cervical vertebrae, uh, sometimes you go, you end up going intralesional. And in chondrosarcomas, if you do a lot of intralesional work, you end up not removing the entire tumor and that can cause a recurrence. And that's what happened in this lady eventually. Uh, a year later, she came back with a recurrence. So spinal metastasis by far is the com uh, is is something that we see very regularly because the spine is the most common area for bony metastasis and it could arise from the breast, the prostate, the lung, thyroid, and the kidney, and seventy percent of them of metastasis occur in the thoracic spine. So another case study on that is a forty-five year old lady who developed sudden onset weakness in both legs, inability to walk, bladder retention, no other known medical illness. Uh, this is what her x-ray looked like. If you look at it very, very carefully, remember what we, we spoke about the ABCs of uh, reading x-rays. So A is alignment and alignment looks okay here. B is the bone. Uh, you look at each vertebra separately and uh, you look at the upper end plate, the lower end plate, and you look at the pedicles and you see that one pedicle is missing here. See that? So you see that there is no... Um, pedicle scene. You can see pedicles below this. You can see pedicles above this. But you see one pedicle missing. It's called the winking owl sign. So the winking owl sign is pathognomonic of a spinal tumor, usually metastasis, uh, which has involved that pedicle and hence not clearly delineated on a X-ray. If you look at the uh, lateral view X-ray, you can see some erosions here. So a CT scan shows that half the vertebra has been eaten up by the tumor. You can see the half which is missing. There's a big tumor there compressing on the spinal cord. And you can see half the vertebra has been eaten by the tumor. And this pedicle is seen clearly. This pedicle is eaten by the tumor. And that's what's missing on the X-ray, the missing pedicle or the winking owl. And this is what the MRI looks like. So MRI shows a large tumor involving the T10 vertebra with significant cord compression that is responsible for her uh, neurological weakness in the lower limbs. And uh, biopsy was done, showed a tumor, uh, secondary tumor arising from a primary in the thyroid. So these are sometimes very vascular tumors. So we did a surgery, two screws above, below, decompressed most of the tumor. So in so very important to be clear on what you're doing surgery for. Is your surgery a curative surgery or is your surgery a palliative surgery? So if you're looking at metastasis, especially if you have multiple metastases, you're looking predominantly at palliative surgeries and uh, removing the compression on the cord and then hoping that the chemo and radio will take care of the rest. But then at the end of the day, they're palliative surgeries to prevent the patient from becoming paraplegic or improving the patient's neurological uh, status. So based to, to decide on who, which of these patients with metastasis requires surgery and who you should not be doing surgery, there are numerous scoring, numerous scoring systems, including the Tokuhashi scoring system, wherein uh, a score of less than five means that the patient is likely to not survive uh, three months and if the patient is unlikely to survive three months then it's better not to put the patient through a major spinal surgery whereas if the patient is likely to survive six months or 12 months or more then surgery on, on the spine is highly recommended to prevent the patient from becoming paraplegic or if the patient is paraplegic to help in recovery of the paraplegia. This is the Tomita score, which tells you based on the tumor, the visceral meds, the bony meds, uh, and what your treatment goal is. Is it long-term control or is it cure or is it palliative? It tells you what kind of surgeries is appropriate for which condition. So that's metastasis, most common, commonly seen. Uh, some of them require surgery. Some of them can be treated with chemotherapy and, and more with radiation. Uh, but if the patient has got neurological deficits or spinal instability, then we consider surgery as the, as the first one. Uh, this is another case study. 57-year-old male came with non-radiating low back pain of three months duration. With sudden onset, lower limb neurology was normal. SLR was negative. And this is what the CT scan looked like. 
uh, why was a CT scan done? The patient came in with a CT scan. So uh, you can see that there is a fracture of this vertebra here. But in addition to the fracture, there is a light, big lytic lesion there. And you can see it more clearly on the axial views. So clearly a tumor-like condition. So that's what the MRI looked like. Single lesion, single lesion, only the L4 vertebra signal, there's this called, uh, sorry, uh, signal changes in the vertebra alone, no significant compression on the uh, neural structures. So this is the axial section, it's called the mini brain appearance, uh, seen in low resolution MRIs only. So indicating that there could be a plasma cytoma. Diagnosis is based on biopsy only. So we do percutaneous fluoroscopy guided biopsies or, or or even CT guided biopsies are possible. So I tend to do my biopsies myself and then uh, we come to a diagnosis based on the biopsy only. So this one turned out to be a plasma cytoma, which we know are plasma cell tumors, uh, which are um, like multiple myelomas, but multiple myeloma being a more generalized disease, plasma cytoma being a more localized disease. It's a diagnostic criteria being a single area of bone destruction, histologically normal bone marrow, uh, in, in if you do a um, ilia crest bone marrow, it's typically likely to be normal. Uh, normal skeletal survey, no anemia, hypercalcemia, renal impairment, um, and uh, absent or low serum urinary uh, monoclonal uh, immunoglobulins. So it's important, uh, just a slide showing different bony lesions, one being a plasma cytoma here, this one being a Paget's disease of the bone where there is expansion of the bone in all directions and this being a hemangioma which are typically um, innocuous uh, conditions found on uh, routine uh, MRIs and x-rays some of some hemangiomas may become aggressive and compress on the bone uh, on the neural structures causing neural um, symptoms but uh, more than likely most of these hemangiomas are benign let's leave that so this is uh, solitary bone plasma cytoma and many of them turn into multiple myeloma. So need to be aware of that. They need to be closely followed up. So this patient, because he had a fracture and the plasma cytoma, we decided to do um, a posterior spinal surgery, bony fusion, and then, and then treat him with radiation and uh, chemotherapy. So that was the plan and that's the end. So we've spoken about Benign bone tumor, uh, benign spinal tumors like osteoosteoma. We've spoken about primary malignant bone tumors uh, like chondrosarcoma. We've spoken about bony metastasis. The treatment of it depends on the primary pathology and how long the patient is likely to survive. Uh, so we decide on whether to do surgery or not based on those factors. And then multiple myeloma, which is probably more common. It's a marrow infiltrative disorder. Uh, which is more common than most of the others. So that is the end of this one. And then I will just go on to my next talk, which is on spinal infections. So I'm speaking of tuberculosis of the spine because tuberculosis is more common in our country. And uh, we talk about lab investigations, a bit of imaging, biopsy, medical management, and then surgical management. So, I mean, as uh, medical practitioners, uh, you are aware that, uh, you know, we are the epicenter of tuberculosis in the world, uh, reporting more than 22 to 25 lakh cases every year, large number of deaths. Um, mm -hmm. But it's important to remember that 50% of all TB in HIV patients is extra pulmonary. So you may not get pulmonary tuberculosis in them. And HIV counseling and testing is now uh, part of uh, TB workup, TB assessment. So 75% of tuberculosis cases are in the lungs and only 15% of them are extra pulmonary tuberculosis. And around 5% of them are pulmonary and extra pulmonary. Now, out of the extra pulmonary and pulmonary group, around 10% are bone and joint tuberculosis. Okay, so it's a very small number uh, of patients who have 
bone and joint injury. So, 10% of the 20% who have extrapulmonary tuberculosis. And out of the 10% with bone and joint tuberculosis, 50% of them have spinal tuberculosis. The reason why spinal tuberculosis gets so much attention is for two reasons. Number one, uh, they can lead to paraplegia. Number two, they can lead to grotesque spinal deformities. So that's why there's been a lot of interest in, in the management of spinal tuberculosis. And um, like I said, in the early stages, it's predominantly based on the history, low-grade fevers, pains, more at night, loss of weight, loss of appetite, all those features that occur with pulmonary tuberculosis also. We know that most of these lab investigations are not very contributory. The WBC count is low sensitivity. ESR is a good uh, sensitive but low specificity, but maybe a good marker of therapeutic response. Um, so is the CRP, good marker of treatment response and returns to normal faster than the ESR. Uh, it's important to remember that serological tests for tuberculosis have been banned. So there is, uh, because they don't really, uh, because they are inconsistent and they are not accurate. So IgGs and uh, interferon, you know, the TB gold tests and things are actually banned by the, by the government. So please don't go into those tests at all. Um, for spinal tuberculosis patients, we don't normally get a manto because it's of doubtful value in our country where there is some exposure to um, tuberculosis, which most people have some exposure to tuberculosis. And you can get false negative ones in disseminated tuberculosis in patients who have high fever after viral vaccinations, after steroids, after, in patients who are immunocompromised, you may end up with a false negative. Um, for spinal tuberculosis, as part of a diagnostic workup, we do not use Manto and don't pay much attention to the to the Manto uh, results as part uh, to make a diagnosis. Imaging is very important. So um, MRI of the spine gives you a good idea uh, of whether you're dealing with infection or some other condition. Whether you're dealing, so it may tell you that you're dealing with an infection based on the presence of pus. But it is very difficult to differentiate between tuberculosis and pyogenic infections based on the MRI. Although we see a lot of MRI reports from radiologists saying likely to be Cox, and then somebody starts off a patient on, on ATD. So it's very important uh, that uh, you make a microbiological diagnosis before starting the patient on ATD, especially for the spine. So there is very limited role for empirical treatment of uh, tuberculosis of the spine and the current recommendations by the Ministry of uh, Health and Family Welfare says wherever possible a biopsy should be done to confirm the diagnosis. So TB and pyogenic infections, pyogenic infections in the spine are on the rise because of immunocompromised patients. And we see a lot of patients who are on renal dialysis coming with um, pyogenic infections. Uh, we recently had somebody who came with uh, brucellosis, spinal infection, so there are some subtle differences on the MRI because bone destruction is usually seen more in tuberculosis than in pyogenic. And the disc is affected very late in patients with tuberculosis, whereas it's affected very early in patients with pyogenic infections. So lots of other differences, paraspinal abscesses and uh, abscesses are seen more commonly in tuberculosis and um, the thoracic spine involvement is more common in tuberculosis, whereas uh, pyogenic infections predominantly affect the lumbar spine because of um, spread of infections from the Batson's venous plexus. So the, if the MRI shows the presence of any infection, it's important to get a biopsy done because tuberculosis mimics pyogenic infections and sometimes tuberculosis also mimics tumors. An accurate diagnosis is, is extremely important before you start off on anti-tuberculosis therapy because it's a long duration of therapy. So you don't want to be on the wrong track and then find out much later on that you were, you've were you missed the diagnosis completely. And the second one is uh, the biopsy can also give you some idea of whether you're dealing with resistant tuberculosis or not. Although less common in Bangalore, uh, but we 
still occasionally see some um, resistant tuberculosis, especially pulmonary tuberculosis. So whether do you do the biopsy open or percutaneous uh, was used to be a debate, but now we know that the percutaneous biopsy is the standard of care. It can be performed even under local anesthetic. It's usually a daycare procedure, so the patient doesn't have to get admitted uh, overnight. Whether it's done by the radiologist or the surgeon is, is variable. It all depends on the access to imaging, availability of interventional radiologists, whether the surgeon or the radiologist has the skill to do a percutaneous biopsy in the spine. And sometimes even cost may you know, guide you towards a radiologist or a surgeon, depending on who's um, less expensive. So it can be done either using a CT scan or a fluoroscopy CM. The outcomes, uh, the adequacy, accuracy, and complications are nearly the same. And the contraindication to biopsy is if the patient has a bleeding diathesis or a very low plate, uh, platelet count or infected soft tissues surrounding a non-infective bony lesion inaccessible areas, sometimes the C1 and the odontoid are inaccessible areas, difficult to get a biopsy from them, and some, some parts of the cervical spine also difficult to get a biopsy from, and, um, yeah, and or if the patient is uncooperative, you may require general anesthesia. It's done with a Jamshedi needle, and uh, we use a 10-gauge needle. Um, these are the roots. Uh, you can go, most, uh, most of our biopsies we'd go through the pedicle because it's a safe zone and we try to get two or three cores of bone like this which we send for aerobic culture, anaerobic culture, ZN stain, gene expert for tuberculosis, tuberculosis culture and histopathology. So ideally six of these tests should be done on the sample that is obtained and the gene expert we know has high specificity, WHO endorsed, results come very early. A uh, few hours in our hospital, we get it within 24 hours. So, and it also gives you an idea of resistance to rifampicin. So that's, that's another important part of the gene expert test. Uh, Zeal Nielsen stain without a culture has a poor negative predictive value. TB culture, gold standard. So if you are able to actually culture tuberculosis from the specimen, it's, uh, you know, highly accurate. Um, and used to take a longer time before. Now with the back tech cultures, you can get it within two or three weeks. Histopathology is another gold standard in the clinical setting. If you are able to see lymphocytes with surrounding necrosis and peripheral giant cells, the typical tubercle, that you see uh, that is uh, pathognomonic of tuberculosis. So once uh, you've made a diagnosis of tuberculosis based on your biopsy, you think about the treatment. So it is important to remember that tuberculosis, the spine is a medical disease. So AKT4 has become synonymous with TB medication, with TB treatment for unfortunately, but it's important to remember that weight appropriate dosage of drugs is important because in AKT4 the dosage of rifampicin is only 450 milligrams whereas that may be appropriate for somebody who's below 50 kilos but anybody who's above 50 kilos weight uh, requires 600 milligrams of rifampicin so um, a weight appropriate dosage of drugs is what is a, what is important if there is uh, MDR TB then uh, you know you, you have you need to go into the second line and third line medications. Uh, and regarding the duration of treatment, there is no strong consensus. There are a lot of people who do whatever works well in their hands. Supplementary therapy is very important. Important to build up their nutrition. Most of our patients with spinal tuberculosis, we put them on a high protein diet and give them adequate um, vitamins, especially vitamin D. Uh, to improve their immunity and vitamin C to improve, improve their immunity. So there were these famous MRC trials that were conducted in the 1970s, the Medical Research Council trials. They were international trials. So, so we learned very, very important lessons from each of these trials. The trials were done in Korea, two centers. The trials were done in Botswana, in Africa. The trials were done in Hong Kong and the trials were done in Madras. So from the Masan trial in, in Korea, we, we learned uh, 
that bed rest was not necessary because prior to that, patients with tuberculosis spine were put on complete bed rest in a plaster jacket. So from the Pusan trials in Korea, 1973, we found out that uh, streptomycin was not necessary in spinal tuberculosis and the POP jacket was of no benefit at all. From the African trials, we found that debridement, surgical debridement of the lesion alone was not effective because it was believed at that time that you need to physically remove the tuberculosis lesion because the antibiotics would not reach that area. But now we know that uh, anti-tuberculosis drugs reach the area in adequate concentrations to result in healing of the lesion. And uh, the Hong Kong trial showed that radical anterior excision was better than debridement alone. And the Madras trial showed that ambulatory chemotherapy alone was as effective as surgery. So those are the results, long-term results of the MRC trials from the Madras Center. Follow up more than 10 years. It showed that 99% of patients on the 99 percent of patients on chemo attained a favorable at nine months. So nine months of therapy, but 94% of them attained a favorable status at six months also. But this was using only two drugs, which is INH and rifampicin alone. So now there are people who are thinking that, you know, is a fixed do fixed duration regime adequate or should you tailor the duration based on the patient and the patient's response to the treatment? Because it has been shown that <coughs> the Tamil Jain's paper, one of the uh, spine surgeons has shown that 35% healed at eight months, 60% healed at 12 months. So um, do the... The conclusion was do not stop ATT by fixed time frame. So they're saying I'll give nine months of treatment and then stop it. So it's important to assess the patient clinically uh, based on the patient's pain and uh, return to normal activities. But important to assess the patient based on laboratory investigations like ESR, CRP and the blood counts. And also a good idea to assess the patient based on radiology. So three things, clinical, laboratory and radiological follow-up is what is necessary and what is necessary, more necessary while deciding to stop treatment. So the question, yeah, the whole question of what is the endpoint of treatment? Is it clinical mark uh, parameters, inflammatory parameters, x-rays, MRIs? So it's a combination of all of these. So when do you consider surgery in tuberculosis of the spine? You consider surgery when the patient has got neurological deficits or the patient has got a uh, kyphosis because of collapse of vertebrae or patient has got significant instability pain that does not seem to be settling down with prolonged ATT treatment. So psoas abscess alone is, in an asymptomatic patient does not require intervention. So that's important to remember. So but Tuberculosis is a medical disease and the indications for surgery are very specific. So this is one, one patient whom we operated on, 37-year-old male, came with a big lesion there in the mid-thoracic spine with paraparesis. So you can see that there was significant pus, significant compression of the spinal cord and UMN signs in the lower limbs and underwent surgery. So we removed most of that infected area, replaced it with a spacer cage, put screws above and below, and then patient gradually recovered uh, his motor function in his legs and was able to walk comfortably. Second one, 45-year-old uh, male, pain, inability to stand and walk with weakness of the knee extensors and a significant kyphosis. You can see the bit of kyphosis on the x-ray because of a sorry, because of the collapse of the vertebra there. You can see that this vertebra and this vertebra are significantly collapsed. And you can see the same thing on the on the uh, MRI also with pus pointing and some granulation tissue compressing the spinal cord there. So this is surgery. So pedicle screws to stabilize the spine, decompression and fusion. And you can see that the vertebrae are healing up well. This is a 35-year-old lady whom we operated on last week. This was her MRI scan from 2020 before the pandemic. So she had a lot of back pain and went to a doctor. Her back pain was not settling down. So they got an MRI and they missed this, this lesion here. I don't know whether you can see it. There's a little bit of lesion here. 
little bit of hyper intensity on both sides of the disc and some hyper intensity inside the disc. So that was missed. So this was in before the last lockdown and the patient came to us two weeks ago and that was what her spine looked like. So significant collapse there. You can see it better there on the MRI. So that is five, four, three. The vertebra number two has completely disappeared. Some parts of it are lying here in, inside this fuss and that's vertebra number one and that's T12. So one full vertebra has gone and uh, she had all this pus and bits of bone compressing on the dura. Fortunately, she was still ambulant, but in severe pain. So we offered, offered her surgery and this is what we did. We did a put in pedicle screws from the back, stabilized the spine and then went in from the, removed all that pus and all that matter. But we were left with this big gap because there was one vertebra missing. So we turned the patient over, went in from the front and put this spacer cage there and bone graft in front so that it heals up in front too. And she is walking two days after surgery. She's gone home now on ATT and uh, doing very well. Uh, another patient, um, big psoas abscess. You can see this psoas abscess here, huge one. There is a lesion there, no compression on the cord, ambulant patient, normal neurology. So vertebral infection with a large source abscess, we just treat them with anti-tuberculous drugs alone. We don't uh, aspirate or drain source abscesses anymore. So in conclusion, avoid unnecessary tests, um, especially uh, serological tests. Uh, Manto really you know, doesn't give you uh, much of a clue to diagnosis in tuberculosis. Uh, a tissue and lab diagnosis is very important, especially a microbiological diagnosis. So ensure that weight appropriate anti, uh, dosages of anti drugs are provided. The duration of therapy, we still don't have any consensus uh, on the duration of therapy for tuberculosis in the spine, but most people give between nine to 12 months. So I give them nine months first and then assess them again clinically based on laboratory investigations and based on imaging. And if it's healed, I stop at nine months. Otherwise, I continue for another three months and then uh, reassess them again. So whether we should give everybody a fixed dose, fixed duration, or tailor it to individual needs is still uh, debated. And like I said, tuberculosis is a medical disease. The indications for surgery are... Uh, Three, number one, if there is a neurological deficit, weakness in the legs or arms because of compression on the spinal cord. Number two, if there is a deformity that is that has occurred or is progressive. And number three, if there is a lot of pain because of instability, does does not seem to be settling down with pain medications and antidepressants. So yes, with that, we come to the end of... Uh, End of the lecture for today and